Good morning, Wabash. Today speaking at the Pioneer Chapel is Dean of the Students, Greg Redding, with his talk entitled, Show Up and Listen. Dean Redding grew up in Indiana and is a 1988 alumnus of Wabash College. He earned his MA and PhD in German Language and Literature at the University of Cincinnati and taught at Washington and Jefferson College in Pennsylvania before joining the Wabash faculty in 2002. Besides teaching German and leading students abroad on immersion programs, he has served the college as fraternity advisor, as a faculty athletic representative, and a member of the board of directors for the National Association of Wabash Men. He is married to Missy Redding and has 16-year-old twin daughters, Gwen and Evie. They live just outside town with their cats and chickens. In his free time, Dean Redding enjoys trail running, birding, and traveling with his family. Please join me in welcoming Dean Redding. Good morning, Wabash. Thank you so much to the men of Sphinx Club for allowing me to be with you all today. I'm giving this talk on kind of short notice, and so my message is not as refined as I would like. But since what I have to say has been on my mind for quite some time, I'm glad to have the chance to think out loud a little bit and help these thoughts coalesce. I should start right off by saying that my talk is directly inspired by the events of March 13th, but cannot include a detailed exploration of those events. In one sense, this is too bad. It would benefit those of us in administrative positions if we could share all our information with the whole campus. It would help everyone understand how and why we make the decisions that we do. But as an educational institution, we are obliged to follow the federal regulations that govern student privacy, specifically FERPA, the uh, Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, which is quite clear on the matter. However, even without those strict mandates in place, it should be our practice as a college to give privacy to any student who gets caught up in a disciplinary case, either as perpetrator or victim. If any of you ever find yourself in such a situation, you'll be grateful that we are always careful to exercise discretion. So today we'll be mindful of recent events, but mostly as a way to help chart our way forward. We're fortunate here at Wabash to have a forum like this, to speak about issues that confront us. But even better than chapel talks are the almost limitless opportunities that we have as an intimate community to engage each other one-on-one -on -one or in small groups face-to-face. -to -face. Today I can talk to you, but that's not the same as talking with you. Uh, and, it's, and it's certainly not the same as you all talking with each other. And so one of my goals this morning will be to give you all some homework because I know you all wish you had more work to do. And I will direct that assignment directly toward the majority students at Wabash. So what do I mean by majority students? The answer to that can be quite complex and could include considerations of social class, sexual orientation, religion, able-bodiedness, even political identity among many other things. But fully recognizing that I am oversimplifying, let's say that in our demographic, Majority students look something like my much younger self as a Wabash student. A white, straight, middle-class kid from a suburban community who was an athlete, joined a fraternity, found easy access to leadership roles on campus, and really faced few serious challenges greater than a GPA-crushing inability to master calculus. Before I give you majority students your homework, though, I want to meditate a bit on words. When we are confronted with shocking moments like we had on the 13th, or outrageous tragedies like we had recently in Atlanta and Boulder, and people in leadership positions respond with thoughts and prayers and statements, we do not feel comforted. 
Those are just words we say. And in those crisis moments, we have the sense that words are not enough. In fact, they're even less than not enough. They feel like an insult when the moment really seems to demand not words, but action. I'll talk about action in a bit. But let's please not lose sight of the fact that words do matter. Perhaps we understand this best in the negative. We do not doubt that words can promote discord. Words are too often used to hurt and to divide. And so in the spirit of the gentleman's rule and in our, and our college mission statement, we must reject any language that is designed to offend, to marginalize, to dehumanize. But just as easily as we can use words to hurt, we can also use them to heal. We use words to show that we care and that we empathize with people who are hurting. Words are our best tools for understanding, the essential first step toward connecting with each other. I think you know this, and so I think you also understand that words really do matter. But in this moment, and here I'm talking again very directly to the majority students at Wabash, it's not your words that matter most here. No. What matters most here are the words of your fellow travelers at Wabash who come from or are part of historically marginalized communities in the United States. At Wabash, they might be minority students, but they may or may not be part of a quote unquote minority in their home communities. It's their voice that most needs to be heard now and in the future. And here's the deal. They have been speaking to you. And more often than not, they have not been heard by enough of us. This academic year alone, there have been double-digit opportunities for you to participate in events sponsored by our minority communities. We've had four chapel talks just this year that speak directly to the African-American experience. The MXIBS and other affinity organizations have sponsored a number of evening presentations that explored timely topics of diversity, equity, and inclusion, or the absence thereof. International student groups regularly invite the Wabash community to celebrate their cultures during festivals and holidays. The Men of Shout sponsor events not just for our gay by and questioning students, but also for allies or potential allies. I have to say, however, that these events are not always well attended by majority students at Wabash. So meaningful opportunities to engage with our non-majority brothers are there. But we too often do not choose to take advantage. And look, I get it. You're busy. I'm interested and invested in all students uh, at Wabash, and yet I don't manage to make it to as many events as I would like. I don't miss them because I've closed my mind to new perspectives, and I'm confident that you don't either. I see how you stand up for your minority brothers in moments of crisis, such as we had last week. It makes my heart glad, and it makes me proud to see that the Wabash Brotherhood is alive. But we can for sure do better and we need to do better for our own personal growth and for the well-being of those who want to be heard. We need to be there for them, not just in the bad times, but also in the good times. As we like to say, always means always. And so at last we come to the homework for you majority students. I just want you to show up and listen. I want you to really listen to your fellow Wallies whose life experiences are significantly different than yours. I want you to cultivate a habit of seeking out opportunities to grow your understanding of others. This assignment should be easy, 
But I can tell you as a foreign language teacher that listening is hard. In foreign language pedagogy, we used to refer to speaking and writing as active skills and reading and listening as passive skills. Ask any Wabash student who has spent a semester abroad on a foreign language program. There is nothing passive about listening. It can be physically exhausting if you are really trying to understand. Listening for understanding takes effort. But it is so worth it when you have those flashes of insight into new perspectives. When you learn to interact with people on their terms rather than yours, you expand your understanding of self and take a step toward becoming a true citizen of the world. But you can't listen if you're not there. So show up. Have an open mind. Concentrate in the moment more on what is being said than on how you want to react to it. You'll have time for reflection later. Cultivating new habits like this is a process. You'll have to work at it. Find something related to diversity on the calendar and go. Take a buddy with you. You may discover an interest that you never knew you had, or maybe not. But you will be a little wiser if you show up and listen. This should be its own reward. Before we go, though, I want to pivot from talking and listening to actions. I want to close with 10 action steps that you and I and others can take and are taking to help majority students expand their awareness of the minority experience at Wabash. Number one, Dean Welch and I are expanding diversity, equity, and inclusion, inclusion training requirements for all housing leaders. We will set higher expectations for demonstrable active engagement with non-majority communities. Emphasis on demonstrable. Number two, in our fraternities, we will push each chapter to establish committees for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we will expect the fraternities to show end-of-term outcomes for DEI engagement. And again here, emphasis on outcomes. The men of Delta Tau Delta are already in the process of developing such a structure for their chapter that could become a model for other fraternities. Number three, in our residence halls, RAs will personally need to adhere to similar expectations for DEI engagement to facilitate their understanding of the students in their dorms. Demonstrated commitment to DEI will be asked of anyone applying in the future to become an RA. Number four, in the wake of those first three actions, I ask all students to demand to see an established interest and commitment to DEI engagement from other students who are looking for your support as they pursue leadership opportunities in student government, independent men's association, interfraternity council, and so on. This should become a basic expectation for student leaders. Number five, safety director Nick Gray and other members of the student life team will expand bystander intervention training to include identity-based bias and we will systematically conduct this training in all living units every year. Uh, and by the way, please do not forget that we have an online form that any of you can use to make my office aware of, poss of uh, any possible identity-based bias issue that we should look into. That form can be found right now on your student resources webpage under uh, health, safety, and security resources. We'll find a more eye-level place for that form to live when we launch our new Student Life website this summer. Number six, 
we. And by we, I mean here members of the student life team and student activity leaders. We'll use the promotion and incentive capabilities of the Presence app to highlight upcoming DEI activities. There are some built-in functions of Presence that may give us a productive way to harness the competitive spirit at Wabash and drive better attendance at DEI events. Number seven, we will continue the DEI components of new student orientation, which includes a unit on cultural competency and a privilege walk. And we will look for new ways to start developing awareness in our incoming students. Number eight, we will continue to expand our outreach and support efforts to students who have historically found life at Wabash to be a bigger adjustment than majority students. Specifically, our domestic students of color, our growing population from South and West Texas and other Latino students, our international students, our GBQ students, and our WLAIP participants. Number nine, while we're working on all this, my faculty colleagues are exploring the possibility of adding a DEI requirement to our curriculum. I strongly urge them to do so. But in the meantime, and this is number 10, you majority students don't need a requirement to take advantage of existing course offerings that explore non-majority thoughts and experiences. Each semester, there are any number of offerings in Asian studies, black studies, Hispanic studies, queer studies, post-colonial studies, just to name a few. There are courses on world religions, world music, foreign language, for example, and many more that will open your eyes to the world and help you better understand your own place in it. As you plan your schedule, dare to take a chance on something outside your normal boundaries. This is the spirit of liberal arts. And so, my fellow majority Wallies, Concrete opportunities to support your minor minority brethren are right in front of you. Will you show up and listen in good times as well as bad? Will you agree with me that the majority community at Wabash, from its inherited position of privilege, has an obligation to actively reach out to minority communities and value them on their own terms. What you learn via thoughtful encounters with non-majority cultures will make you better prepared for the increasingly diverse professional world that you will enter after graduation. And while you're here, the better we all know each other, the fewer openings we will have for conflict and misunderstandings of the type that we had here last week. We talk often about the concept of one Wabash. It's time to show it. Thank you.